Welcome back to my classroom. It's a beautiful day. I'm Matt Dominguez here with teacher to teacher tips, especially for materialism right now. And there are a couple key things that I can offer other teachers from my experience of teaching materialism. Introducing it, I think one of the keys is to even just start with the images. I think they're profound. You look at electricity striking the periodic table of elements. That's it. And we just, I, I like to sit there and think like, you guys, what are the consequences? If it is true that only that which we can measure, electrons, electricity, waves, and the material realm, if that's the only thing that truly exists, what are the consequences of that as it works down to the big questions? And so then I like to bring in Frankenstein, not because of the monster and the chaos, but when we look at that picture of Frankenstein, Mary Shelley wins the award for the scariest novel when she helps the readers understand the weight and gravity that if all we have to do is dig up flesh and run electrons through it and we get animated flesh, that's all we are. Most of us have not really paused to think of the consequences of there's no creator, there's no spiritual realm. There's no, the nice thing is there's no demons. There's no angels, but there's no demons. There's no hell. There's no heaven. There's none of that out there. So what we are faced with, as uh, the friendly atheist, when he came and visited my classroom, said is, you make me sound like I'm a sack of chemicals. But he also said, which I guess is true. <laughs> And so I think like really spending as much time as necessary to look at the weight and the gravity of all we are is a closed system of cause and effect. And so it really is, I'm reacting to the environment around me and I'm a closed system. Everything is cause and effect. I have my biologist teacher friend come in for a few minutes and we have this dialogue about the truth that if that's true, biologically, a human being has no free will. I think it's a great place to start. Your choice is a reaction to the chemical in your brain and the environment around you. I press a button on a computer, this happens. Here's my sensory input, here's my sensory input, something happens. Yes, it's super complex. Yes, at the atomic level, we're even considering the fact that we can't even predict how an electron will move. I get all of that. It's still either random or cause and effect, but there's no free will. Teacher tip to help with that is I bring up on screen either a video or a picture of a player piano. And a player piano, you crank it up and then the keys are playing and it looks like someone's sitting there. And so there's a song and a tune playing, but I remind them that there is no buddy sitting down playing a song. Whatever's in that tube is whatever song is going to show up. Theism, by contrast, is saying we have a soul which is not part of this body, but it's in it and working with it and works with this body to create the opportunity for free will. Very different philosophical premise to work from. Materialism says no soul, no spirit, nothing outside of the cause and effect. So in theism, we have a piano with a player who can choose to play what song, they can play a good song or a bad song, right? Theism, excuse me, materialism, player piano, it's all cause and effect. A uh, couple other tips that I like to use there is bringing up uh, Dawkins and his, his whole concept of genetic theory and to realize that genes are the tube in the player piano. And so we, we lean into, if that's true, I am genetically predisposed to have this color hair, this color jaw structure, these types of muscles, and maybe even genetically predisposed to have this certain personality, or maybe genetically disposed to be an alcoholic or a genius or whatever, or all of the above. I have no control over my hair color. What this is saying is that genetically, I have no control over really anything I do. It's all cause and effect. We can't, there's no blame to be had for anybody. What 
what it boils down to, and this is where I go, is human behavior is all observed behavior. As you go through those seven questions for materialism, lean into the consequences for trusting those answers. And a, a couple key ones that you're going to hit is the morality one and realizing that morality is completely ice cream. Like it is subjective. It is completely relative. And it's based off of, really you could say preference, but it's really just based off of human behavior. A uh, thing that I use that really helps students understand is I had a scenario with my twins and they were five and we were watching Planet Earth and it was that wonderful one with the million caribou going across the screen. And uh, I'm sitting there and Anna's here and Eli's here. I'll never forget this moment and it's perfect for teaching materialism because the little baby caribou got separated from its mom and it's in the upper corner of the screen and then the wolf comes in the bottom corner of the screen and then the, the helicopter you know, shot is on with the chase. And then I say, don't get separated from mom. But then we watch it and I realize that Anna is cheering for the caribou and Eli's going, wolf, wolf. Whoa. And Anna's going, caribou, run caribou, wolf, wolf, wolf. And the wolf has a wonderful lunch and Anna's crying and Eli's going, yeah, wolf. And I'm not going to say evil wolf, good, care, poor caribou. We just observed the behavior of these animals. There's no morality on that situation. Let me reverse that and say that that's, that's all human behavior is all that type of observed behavior. There's no objective morality imposed on it. The other one that I think is really important is leaning into the last question that we have in the book, which is the meaning and purpose of life. And I write the word, why do we exist? We put a circle around it and a cross. There is no why. And we don't say life is meaningless. That implies meaning. They say that life is absurd. We need to embrace the ridiculous absurdity of just going with the flow of life. Some students will like that. Most students, when we pause and reflect upon the gravity of that, get a little overwhelmed by the consequences of life being completely absurd. I have no free will. And when I die, it's just done. That has a weight to it that can be really, really heavy. The way to honor materialism is that if this is true, then they are right. It's even in scripture. <laughs> Solomon says that life is meaningless. You chop out God and life is meaningless. We don't have to argue against those truths if there is no spiritual realm and there is no creator. Ironically, even with the fullness of Christ, when you do reject God in your life, the truths of material, materialism actually apply in a very unique way that give perspective to why there's so much weight in that philosophy and that worldview. Um, one last thought that I would I'd like to insert for teachers as they talk about materialism is that we have to deal with the problem of pain. In all of these, we have to deal with the problem of pain. In idealism, Buddhism will lean in to say that life is suffering. That's why we got to get out of here. In monism, we're just going to say that suffering is part of God and we need to see it from the perspective of the sufferer and try to make the most out of it. Interestingly, in materialism, we still have to deal with suffering and pain. It just has no objective meaning at all. It just exists. And then we have to deal with it in theism as well. But it's important to address the fact that there still is suffering, there still is pain. We're not going to call anything evil, but it's things that we don't like still exist. They don't just go away if you get rid of spirituality or get rid of God. And uh, that's an important thing to address. Further up and further in.